connection is a touch that creates a, a spark. spark. Illuminating challenges. Inspiring ideas. Connection takes us from where we are to where we could be. Connection lifts us up. Takes us further than we could ever go alone. Connection is the merging of many voices into one. When science, stories, people, ideas connect, connect. we can leave this planet better, better than, than we found, found it. Better than we found it. Connection has the power to wake us up, to start a revolution, to inspire action, and ignite change. Please welcome Chairman of the Board for the National Geographic Society, Gene Case. Well, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the National Geographic Society Board of Trustees, and really on behalf of everyone here at National Geographic, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Explorers Festival 2019. And to the more than 200 explorers gathered here with us on campus, we say welcome home. To those joining by live stream, I want to offer a special hello and welcome. So each year, this gathering brings together the larger National Geographic family and community. And as we get started, I want to take just a moment to recognize the extraordinary leaders and champions of our work that we have with us here today. Tracy Wollstonecroft, CEO of the National Geographic Society, is here with us. Tracy took the reins of the Society last October, although he's not new to National Geographic. Tracy served on the board for a decade before stepping into the CEO chair. Gary Nell is with us, chairman of National Geographic Partners. Gary's no stranger to all of us, having stepped into the NGP CEO role after serving five years as CEO of the National Geographic Society. Several of my fellow trustees from the National Geographic Society board are with us. We're so fortunate to have leaders who are so passionate about our mission and so dedicated to our work. We're grateful to have Peter Rice with us here from the Walt Disney Company. Peter serves as chairman of Disney Television and co-chair of Disney Media Networks. Peter's also a treasured colleague and chairman of the National Geographic Partners Board, where he has served with us for many years prior to the recent Disney acquisition of Fox. We're also joined by distinguished members of the National Geographic Hubbard Council, who play an important role in supporting our work. Our colleagues from across the society and across National Geographic Partners. Our valued donors and corporate partners, and we're so happy to welcome not just Peter, as I mentioned earlier, but a number of new colleagues here with us from the Walt Disney Company this week. You'll hear more about our new partnership with Disney in the coming days. And hopefully, you'll get a sense of why we're so enthusiastic about the opportunities to propel the National Geographic mission in new and exciting ways with Disney. Thanks to Disney, this year, more than half of the revenues of the National Geographic Society will come from this valued partnership, enabling us to support many of you. And there are other partnerships that are important to our work as well. We're very proud of and grateful for our longstanding partnership with Rolex, built on a foundation of pioneering exploration and a deep commitment to a perpetual planet. And we are immensely grateful for their partnership. Another major focus of this week's programming will highlight National Geographic's valued partnership with the Weiss Foundation on the Campaign for Nature, 
which aims to inspire the protection of 30% of the planet by 2030. And now, as we kick off this week, we're celebrating many firsts. Not only do we have more explorers with us than ever before, but we are so proud of the unprecedented diversity that they represent. Indeed, more than, our ha more than half of the explorers with us this year have traveled from outside the United States, representing more than 50 countries and more than 70 disciplines, including oceanographers, archaeologists, photographers, conservationists, educators, biologists, geologists, journalists, astrophysicists, and many, many more. Were you wondering when I was going to stop? <laughs> and for the first time ever, the gender representation is 50-50. I think that deserves it. <laughs> Last night at dinner, Gary Nell reminded me that the split was 80-20 when he took the helm as CEO just a little over six years ago. So that's real progress. Now, if you've had a chance to walk the halls yet this week, then you know just how excited and energized we are to have you here with us. And for all of us, we consider the Explorers Festival to be one of the most exciting and truly treasured events of the year. It's thanks to the contributions of many of you in this room and the many explorers who came before you that we're able to stand here today and celebrate an enduring legacy of illuminating the wonders of the world, promoting science and innovation, backing cutting edge research, and supporting intrepid exploration. Indeed, for 131 years, we have believed in the power of science, exploration, storytelling, and education to change the world. From our founding, this has been in our DNA and has animated our mission. Our iconic yellow border has long served as a portal to the world, and our National Geographic flag has traveled across the world with explorers as they have gone to the front lines of the unknown and made some of the greatest contributions of our century. Our National Geographic flag has gone to the deepest depths of our oceans, to the summit of Everest, the flag rode with John Glenn in Friendship 7 as he became the first American to orbit the Earth. And then, it wasn't too many years later, when the flag accompanied the astronauts to the moon with the Apollo 11 mission. The flag became part of the iconic images of Jane Goodall's groundbreaking work that transformed our understanding of great apes and what it means to be human. And the tradition continues today thanks to many of you. In this past year, for instance, the flag was planted in a refugee camp in Uganda, where we held a photo camp, putting cameras in the hands of refugees so they could tell powerful stories. Today, our National Geographic explorers, including those of you gathered here, are continuing to change the world in momentous ways. And this week, their important contributions will be on display as they share with us how they're leading a new era of knowledge and discovery. Today's symposium kicks off a week of unparalleled programming. Almost 100 speakers will connect us with the natural world. They'll reveal new insights about cultures and our own human journey. And they'll talk to us about new frontiers in science and space. In this spirit, the conversations we have this week will explore some of the most important questions of our time and dare to envision what the future holds. If you've joined us for a National Geographic Explorers Festival before, then you've seen firsthand the power of convening of a global community of change makers, including explorers, innovators, entrepreneurs, partners, and many others to ignite change. It's the power of a teacher connecting with a marine biologist, a filmmaker connecting with a technologist. They are the collaborations that can lead to new solutions and new innovations to solve some of the most pressing problems of our time. 
Today, it's more important than ever that National Geographic stays on the forefront of science and exploration, and our explorers are on the front lines of this work. This is why we're so excited to welcome our explorers home. This is why we celebrate them and all that they've accomplished. And this is why we are more committed than ever before to continue investing in and spotlighting the work of our explorers. We've got so much in store for you this week, and we can't wait to get started. I do want to offer a word of warmest thanks to the teams here at National Geographic who've worked so hard and so diligently to put together a terrific series of events this week. Please join me in giving them a hand. <laughs> and finally, as we kick off this week, let us commit together to make the most of our time together. Let's commit to collaborate, continue to push boundaries, take new bold risks, and dare to envision a world that's brighter and healthier for future generations. To our explorers, as you move forward, let us assure you, along with everyone at National Geographic, we're cheering you on, and we can't wait to see how this experience changes you and the world. In just a moment, we'll be joined by an incredible group of scientists who have explored the next frontier. In the spirit of pioneering exploration and discovery, I can't think of a better group to kick off our program than three former US astronauts and founders of the Constellation Foundation. They've had the rare and truly wonderful opportunity to see Earth from space, and we're thrilled to hear more from them now. Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten, nine. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have. We have lift off. Lift off at 7:51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the tower. Roger. Howdy here, Houston. Right and clear. Stand by for a call for the backup comm check, over. All right, here. Stand by, Wine Bill. Again, over Tanana Reeve at 209er. Roger, Michael. Thank you. All right, how does it feel up there? Oh, my God, look at that picture over there. There's the earth coming up. Wow, that pretty. You got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color. Quick, oh, man, that's cool. Quick. Where is it? Quick. Oh, I got a ray. Oh, that's a beautiful shot. Oops. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Ron Garrett. I'm here with my friends Nicole Stott and Anusha Ansari. And we want to share some stories with you today. Um, but before we do, we want to set the stage by talking about one specific image. Now, images have the power to change our perspective. They can change the way we see our world. They can change the way we see ourselves. And there's probably no image that has changed the way we see ourselves more than an image that was taken on Christmas Eve, 1968. Now, the story begins 50 years ago, atop the tallest, the heaviest, the most powerful rocket ever brought to operational status, the Saturn V, sat the crew of Apollo 8. The mission objective was to be the first crewed spacecraft in history to travel to the moon, enter into orbit around the moon, and of course to return back safely. Now, this would propel the United States in the race to be the first on the moon, to propel them ahead of the, of the Soviet Union. But after reaching the moon and entering into orbit around the moon, the crew witnessed something never seen before by human eyes. As the crew experienced the Earth rising from behind the lunar horizon, 
I wonder if they realized the significance of that moment. They had just become the first humans in history to see the, the whole Earth as a planet and the first to capture that for the rest of us. This famous photograph, commonly known as Earthrise, is probably the most influential photograph ever taken. This image showed us for the first time our living planet, our biosphere, our Earth. It revolutionized how we see the world, how we see ourselves with its simple message that we are one people traveling on one planet towards one shared future. In this breathtaking beauty is a deep heralding to the unity, to the unity that we as a species are called to. Since then, less than 600 people have traveled to space. The three of us standing before you have had that privilege. We were able to escape the confines of our planet and look back and profoundly experience seeing our beautiful planet from the vantage point of space. I was born a long, long time ago in a country far, far away, <laughs> in Mashhad, Iran. Um, I loved the night skies. I would sleep outside summer nights and look at those stars, and I wanted to fly up there and touch them. I wanted to understand what they're made out of. I wanted to understand what our world made out of us and how it's built. This love of space allowed me to um, you know, exercise my imagination. When I was 12 years old, before I knew it, there was a revolution in Iran. Um, there were shouting, screaming, burning buildings, gunshots. I was scared. I had never heard a gunshot before. Before I could even adjust to that, there was a war. There was an eight-year war that broke out with, between Iran and Iraq. And uh, th within the first year, there were bombings. There were long lines for food and sh uh, fuel. Um, there were uh, gunshots and sirens. We had to go to shelter. It was a scary time for me. But there was one place I could always go at night and look at the beautiful night skies and let my imagination take me to a different place, to a different planet perhaps, some place that was peaceful, some place there were no gunshots, some place that I could take the rest of my family and everyone who wanted to go with me and be safe and be playful. And that's what I wanted to do. On September 18, 2006, I had the amazing opportunity to fly to International Space Station for an 11-day mission. It was my dream come true. I was now actually floating in space where I wanted to go amongst those stars that I dreamed of. I was looking at our planet, and I was able to see this beautiful canvas of tans and crimsons of the desert with the deep greens of the forests and highlighted by the whites of the highest mountain peaks. I could see the glow of the serpentine rivers as they flow, flowed into the sea. And it was an amazing, colorful uh, canvas that I was looking at. But what amazed me the most was these deep blue colors, the different shades of blue of our ocean, which covers most of our planet, our blue planet and I was mesmerized by it. I looked down on Earth and what I could see and feel was this um, energy, life energy coming from it. I could see no borders, no walls, nothing was dividing us, we were all one. And the feeling that I got, the sense of oneness that I had with the planet and with everyone else on it, was something that I wanted to share with everyone. I wanted to be able to tell everyone how we're connected and we're all citizens of one planet Earth, that we're all astronauts on this spaceship Earth going through the universe together. And I imagine how that would transform everyone's lives. So my dream of becoming an astronaut was realized when I, along with the crew of STS-124, launched into space aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. But I remember that first day, that first day in space, the most remarkable, the most memorable, the most amazing thing was when I had the opportunity to look out of the window for the first time. When my tasks were over, I got to unstrap and float over to a, to a window. Uh, it was just absolutely breathtaking. And I remember the, the first thing that hit me 
was just how incredibly thin our atmosphere appeared. And in that moment, that sobering moment, I was hit with the realization that that paper thin layer is what's keeping every living thing on this planet alive. But in spite of this fragility, I couldn't help but fall in love with the beauty of our planet. It's a, it's a constant dance of, of color and light and motion. And what was really amazing and beautiful was to see the colors change on the Earth, to see thunderstorms casting long shadows across the horizon, and watch the clouds turn from pink to red to gray, and finally to black. And then as we crossed into the, the dark side of the orbit, to see all the lights of the cities and towns, all the evidence of human activity, all of a sudden come to life. And it really gave me the sense that we live on a living, breathing organism. Now, we saw amazing things, many amazing things in space. The paparazzi-like flashes of lightning storms, dancing curtains of auroras that seemed so close. It was almost as if we could reach out and touch them. Now, this was an incredibly overwhelming visual experience, but it was, it was also much, much more than just a visual experience. What I experienced in space was a profound sense of gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity to see the planet from that perspective, and gratitude for the planet that we've been given. And in some way, I don't think I'll ever be able to fully put into words, being physically detached from the Earth made me feel deeply interconnected with everyone on it. Now, although I didn't have the, the view of the Earth that the Apollo 8 guys had, nevertheless, from space, I was able to look back and see what we have always been, one single human family with a common origin. And now, in a very real way, I had a deep awareness of the reality of our common future. And as you can tell, we all, <laughs> we all what? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. We all share similar feelings about uh, our experience in space. Even with some of the different twists on the stories about it, the underlying reaction is the same. Flying in space brings us back to Earth. We see a living, breathing planet. It is our home. It brings us back to home. And while there are a lot of complex things that go on while we're in space, I came home with three very simple lessons to share. And that's that we live on a planet, we are all Earthlings, and the only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets us all. Now these stunning views, they remind us of what it was like to be in space. It is, like Ron said, overwhelmingly, impressively beautiful. And while it looks like we're slowly passing over the planet, I know that we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, or five miles a second, which means that we get one of these stunning sunrises or sunsets every 45 minutes as we go around the Earth every 90 minutes. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And these views also remind me, like Ron said, how separated I was. But how in contrast to that physical distance, I don't think I ever felt any more connected to everyone and everything below me than I did right then. Every time I looked out the window, there was some new surprise. The vastness of the oceans. There was a depth and color and texture to them that I had never experienced or felt before. And when I looked out the window, I wanted to see familiar things. I wanted to see Florida from space. I considered Florida my home. But very quickly, Florida became just this special place on Earth that's my home. I don't know when exactly that happened, but believe me, it does. I started thinking about Earth not just as home, but as a planet, as a planet in space, and as a living organism. I couldn't deny the interconnectivity of everything that I saw below me. And I started thinking about us all as Earthlings. So during my six months in space, I, I got into a routine where I'd, I would almost say goodnight to the Earth. When my tasks were over, it was time to get ready for bed. I would go to the cupola, which is this windowed observatory on the bottom of the space station. And I would just gaze at the Earth for a little while. And as I would gaze back at this, at this beautiful scene, I, I would wonder what the next 50 years would look like? How far would we progress in overcoming the challenges facing our planet? And as I would take in this beautiful scene, I would routinely be hit in the gut with a sobering contradiction between the beauty of our planet 
and the suffering that exists on our planet. What I couldn't reconcile was the indescribable beauty of our seemingly peaceful blue planet suspended in this inky blackness. And yet, on that same planet, there are untold tragedies that happen every day. So as many of our colleagues report from the ISS, you can actually see the negative effect humans have made on our planet. Clear cutting of forests, mountaintop removal operations, industrial pollutants entering rivers, giant crop burnings that, that cover whole areas of, of, the, of the globe that send smoke to the limits of the atmosphere up to, you know, to cover almost entire continents. I launched into space with the belief that we already right now have all the technology, all the resources necessary to solve many, if not all, the problems facing our planet. And so I spent a good deal of my time earth gazing, pondering the question, if this is true, why do they still remain? And more importantly, what can we do to address these challenges? The seeds to the answer to that question <clears throat> lies in our shared experience of living and working on the International Space Station and the valuable lessons that experience gives us for life here on Earth. So for my time in space, this was my home, this beautiful masterpiece in space, the International Space Station or the ISS. There is no better example of living off the grid than the ISS. <laughs> there are systems that regulate all the conditions that we need to survive. The right amount of oxygen for us to breathe, clean water for us to drink. But these systems are not automatic. They require care and maintenance and attention. And we go about our daily activities, our science experiments in space, and these life support systems are what keep us alive in an otherwise lifeless expanse of space. Through the ISS, we have created mechanical systems in space that do the best we can to mimic what our planet does for us naturally. So as you heard, uh, on Space Station, we rely on machines. These machines are uh, you know, our life support system, and we take good care of them. And uh, you can bet if something goes wrong with any of those machines, everyone will come together, collaborate, and make sure that we fix it immediately, because we can't live without them. So we're hoping that we can apply the same sense of urgency here on our planet. We're all crew of the spaceship Earth, and we need to take care of our life support system to have a beautiful, peaceful spaceship that we can all live on. Here at home, we need to come together, collaborate, and uh, be able to fix and restore our life support system. In the words of uh, legendary Buckminster Fuller, we should learn how to become crew of the spaceship Earth, not just passengers. And on the ISS, we are acutely aware of the conditions that are necessary to sustain life. And with our help, the machines do this for us. When we return from our time in space, though, even though we intellectually knew it before, we become acutely aware that we require these same conditions down here on Earth to survive. But down here on Earth, it's not the machines that do this for us. They aren't creating those conditions. It's life itself. It's the living, breathing planet. It's the humans and plants and animals. It's the chemical mixtures of air and the oceans. It's the Earth itself, all interconnected, that creates these conditions. It's biodiversity. And as you've heard tonight, the two most important things uh, about the International Space Station are that we have these amazing, strong international relationships that it's built on. But perhaps more importantly, is that we're living there like we should be living here on Spaceship Earth. We must all work together to protect our biosphere, the life support systems of our planet, for ourselves and for the benefits of the countless possible next generations and for all life. Because of this, we decided to get all of our astronaut friends together uh, and we've launched a couple years ago an organization called Constellation. And our first mission is inspired by the work of E.O. Wilson's Half Earth uh, and the Convention on Biological Diversity. So we are working to advocate for and to point attention to this important work and so that together we can inspire the actions necessary for nations to sign and embrace the pivotal Convention on Biological Diversity in uh, 2020. 
We want to bring together astronauts, and we are bringing together astronauts from all around the world to share their profound experiences of seeing the beauty of the, our planet from space, from their different national, cultural, uh, religious backgrounds, and partner with National Geographic Society and work with all the various organizations signed up for Campaign for Nature. And we want to work with all of you, in addition to that, advocating for this most important set of goals in our civilization's history. So our shared vision, constellations, Nat Geos, hopefully all of you here in this room and anyone that you touch outside of these rooms, is to come together and make sure that we can preserve 30% of Earth's biodiversity by 2030 and increase that to 50% by 2050. We also need to make sure that we meet all the 17 sustainable development goals and we do everything possible to make sure that we don't have global warming um, exceed the limits of one and a half degree Celsius. This is just called good housekeeping. It's called planet, planetary stewardship. And we have to all work together and aspire to live up to these goals. And no matter where we're from, what we do, what nation we're from, we have to do it together. And we have to come together to make our planet safe again. Our time in space has proven that when we start from a foundation of awe and wonder, we open the mind to new ideas and solutions that encourage cooperation together. And it's only through profound cooperation and a shared mission that we'll build a future that we all want to, to experience here on Earth. Awe and wonder are the secret ingredient that changes everything. They can allow us to create a better future. There should be no passengers on Spaceship Earth, only crewmates. And as crewmates, we are all responsible for the minding of the ship and the care of each other. I hope you can tell that we as Constellation, uh, as our crew, are excited to be uh, joining National Geographic uh, as a voice for uh, the Campaign for Nature. And together, we know that we can create a positive future where all life thrives. Thank you. Well, I think we can agree that that powerful opening is a great tee up for the festival, but also a great tee up for our first panel conversation on the new era of discovery. You know, technology is a driver in so much of our daily lives, helping us explore the world around us and make decisions on what route to take to work, what jacket to bring as we walk out the door. So how can we use technology to advance the exploration of our planet. National Geographic is committed to developing innovative technology with our National Geographic Labs team. I want to share one exciting project that the Labs group currently has in development called the Canopy Drone. Here's a video of the drone being tested in a forest canopy piloted by a Labs team member via remote control. National Geographic is working with the Illinois, in, Illinois Institute of Technology to incorporate autonomy into the drone. So it's capable of flying and navigating through very complex environments without the need for GPS or the need of a human pilot. This technology will radically reduce the cost of monitoring and it will accelerate our ability to conduct biodiversity and wildlife monitoring in densely forested areas where you cannot see the animals from above. The speakers you are about to meet are also using technology to help them explore the world and gather data in new and exciting ways. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Heather Lynch is a quantitative ecologist studying penguin populations in Antarctica. Very Nat Geo. Please welcome Heather Lynch. Well, thank you very much. Antarctica is changing, 
And nowhere is it changing more rapidly than on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, where it's getting warmer, wetter, and the sea ice is breaking up earlier each year. These changes are having major impacts on the wildlife in the region. And as a penguin biologist specializing in population dynamics, it was one of the highlights of my research career when National Geographic approached me as they prepared their November 2018 feature special on the region. They asked me, well, how many penguins are there in the region? And do we know how their populations have changed? And you can see my answer in the graphic behind me. The Antarctic Adelie penguin, their populations have crashed, even as the more sub-Antarctic Gentoo population has skyrocketed. We know that because on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, we can survey these populations the old-fashioned way, accessing colonies by boats and counting nests one by one. But there are some colonies that are too big, too remote, too inaccessible to be monitored this way. In fact, it turns out that the majority of our uncertainty about how many penguins there are stem from colonies like Zavodovsky Island behind me. We can't count individual penguin heads to monitor these populations. So to solve this problem, my lab and several others around the world are pioneering the use of satellite imagery as an alternative method of monitoring these populations. Now, when we're monitoring them from satellites, we're not counting individual penguin nests anymore. Instead, what we're doing is we're using the, the guano stain, that pinkish red stain you see in the photograph. And it turns out that that guano stain that's left behind at the colony, we can use its area to estimate the number of penguins that are breeding within it. So satellite imagery has radically transformed our ability to monitor penguins, not just the ones that we can access directly, but all around Antarctica. And not just in one year, but in every year. In fact, satellite imagery can do one step better because it turns out that the spatial pattern of the penguins on the landscape, whether it's one big area or they're fragmented across the landscape, that's telling us something important about the health of the colony, whether it's increasing or whether it's declining and may be at risk of critical collapse. So satellite imagery is not just giving us more information, it's actually in many cases giving us better information. So the challenge now becomes not can we access these colonies to survey the populations directly, but how do we possibly deal with the volumes of information that we're now getting? We get tens of thousands of satellite imageries from Antarctica every year. And there just aren't enough penguin biologists in the world to annotate and to interpret all of that satellite imagery. So the key now is in automation and with help from the National Science Foundation and NASA and most recently the AI for Earth program, my lab is pioneering the use of computer vision and machine learning to automate the detection of penguin colonies and satellite imagery. One of our big early successes in this arena was our discovery in the danger islands of several very, very large Adelie penguin colonies. The Danger Islands is an island chain off the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula that is so small, it does not even appear on maps of Antarctica. And yet it turns out there are more Adelie penguins in the, Antarctic, in the Danger Islands than the entire rest of the Antarctic Peninsula combined. And yet the vast majority of these penguins were not known to exist before we discovered them in Landsat imagery using automated algorithms that would find guano forests in places we never expected it. In response to our discovery, the proposed marine protected area for the Western Antarctic Peninsula was expanded by upwards of 2 million hectares to include this important biological hotspot. And it's such a beautiful illustration of how better technology really can lead to better conservation. We can also use satellites to plan expeditions to the region, like we did when we went to the Danger Islands. And that allowed us to deploy another amazing tool for penguin conservation, and that's drones. Drones allow us to map, up in, map out in extraordinary detail all of the penguins at a colony, and we can count each individual nest. But drones also allow us to reconstruct a three-dimensional model of these colonies, as you can see in the lower left of the screen. And these three-dimensional models allow us to understand how penguin colonies are responding to the landscape terrain, but also how over hundreds or thousands of years of occupation, penguins are actually shaping the islands on which they live. The threats that face penguins are as urgent as they've ever been, but with machine learning and computer vision, drones and satellite imagery, we have the capacity to monitor their populations and respond to threats like never before. 
I'm super excited to see where technology will take penguin conservation over the next decade. And now I hope you're excited as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Heather, that was terrific. So next, we have a pair of explorers who work side by side in the same lab, looking at life in the deep sea, or what Bob Ballard likes to remind us can be called the final frontier. Please welcome marine ecologist Whitney Goodell and ocean conservation ecologist Jonathan Giddens. So I'm an ocean ecologist, and I study the deep sea. What I love about ecology is that it's not a study of things, but a study of relationships within a system. And a deep perspective of ecology also looks at the relationship between people and nature. And I developed this, this perspective because when I grew up, I would draw everything that I learned about at school. Every subject had a journal, and I would stay up sometimes all night illustrating the pages. And through drawing, I learned to see nature as a whole and not something with just little parts that are subtractable. Because in a drawing, things make sense in relation to everything else. And so I believe in the tradition of the early naturalists that art is a partner in the scientific um, exploration of the deep sea. I'm Whitney Goodell. I'm a marine ecologist and a National Geographic Fellow with Exploration Technology Labs. Something that I hear a lot, and I've actually already heard it a couple times this week from some of you, probably, um, is, oh, you work with the ocean. I always wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid. I, on the other hand, when I was five years old, I told my family on a trip to Hawaii we were heading to the beach and sorting out the day's activities, and I told my family, I didn't want to snorkel. The ocean was this unknown place. I didn't know what was below the surface, and I didn't want to go snorkeling around in the unknown, which is kind of an ironic start to my career and my character. Um, but it really begs the question, what else don't we know, and how is that limiting us? the deep sea. You've heard it before, we know more about the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars than we do about the bottom of the ocean. The deep sea is a huge unknown. The deep sea is the Earth's last frontier. It's often pictured as a desolate place so remote that it might as well be another planet. But the ocean makes up 99% of the living space on this planet, and only 5% of the deep sea has been explored. So we do not know our own home. Up until relatively recently, the challenge had been, well, how do we actually get there? So it was not even 100 years ago that naturalist Beebe and engineer Barton devised the bathysphere, a two-ton ball of steel that they crawled inside and went a half a mile deep down um, into the bottom of the ocean off of Bermuda. But imagery and photography had not advanced enough at that time to take pictures there. So what Beebe did is he called on a telephone line up to the surface to artist Bosselman on the surface. And as he peered out of the portholes in the deep, she was up there drawing and painting these creatures that he described as he discovered this area. So while technology took the two men down to the bottom of the ocean, it was art that brought the deep sea into the hearts and minds of people. Now, with the Deep Ocean Drop Cam, developed by National Geographic Exploration Technology Lab, the deep sea is in reach like never before. It's instead of a two-ton ball of steel, it's just bigger than a basketball, and it goes down to the surface uh, sorry, no, it goes from the surface down to the bottom of the ocean and takes video footage, high definition video footage of the seafloor. So here we're seeing a six gill shark down at 900 meters um, under crushing pressures. So this is far, far below diving depths. Um, under crush crushing pressures and perpetual darkness until the drop cam illuminates the scene. One more back. So how it's programmed to record for a number of hours. 
Oh, the, so well, we had a video, but it's not playing. Anyways, imagine. So it's a program to record. For, there it is. OK. <laughs> Still imagine. So it records. <laughs> and then it, when it's done recording, it pops up to the, it releases its weight, pops up to the surface, and then sends a chirp over VHF radio where we can um, use an antenna and locate where it is and thereby image the deep like never before. And because this technology now comes in travel size, it can go all over the world. So we actually have video footage, like what you saw a couple slides ago, from all of these points on the globe. And this is growing. Um, but these cameras really open up opportunities for, they open up the doors to opportunistic deployments. So if a ship is going somewhere and they're doing research off that ship, well, great, let's get some cameras on there, throw them overboard, let's see what's down there. And so this is really helping us build a spatial understanding of where things live. But it's really cool that we can take it one step further and we can start exploring why do things live where they live. So in order to explore that, we pull in data, we pull in different kinds of data like habitat data and um, sea surface temperature or ocean chemistry, and we can start layering on that information over what we already have, over our points. And so we start with our points, we, then we can look at spatial things, like how far away is it from different habitats, like trenches or plateaus? Is it near spreading ridges? What's the sea surface temperature? Does that matter? What's the ocean chemistry, phosphate concentrations, nitrate? So we can start looking at all of this information that already exists. We can layer it on and start really understanding the differences between each of these places that we have video footage. And by that, we can really start exploring the relationships between these things. So with the video footage that you saw, in a process of annotation, which is identifying and counting the species present, I construct biodiversity indices so that we can map biodiversity in the deep sea. And with the environmental variables that Whitney showed, I can model the relationship between biodiversity and its environment so that we can better understand and inform management of these systems based on science. But the process of discovery does not stop there. This is from a recent uh, expedition to the Seychelles where we were collecting imagery of the seafloor, but I was also using imagination to sense my relationship with the ocean in deep time. And these are the types of transformative experiences that I want to share from these places. So as scientists and explorers, we often get to go to these places that are remote and wild and beautiful, and not that many people get to go there. And I want everybody to feel connected to the ocean as a thing of beauty that they're a part of. And so I think that going forward, we can bridge art and science and technology to together not only go further, but also bring back the awe and wonder that we find. So please follow us into the deep. And if there's anybody also interested in incorporating science into your you know, art, into your science, science into your art, please reach out. I'd love to speak with you. So the deep sea really is our big unknown. And this, you know, how can we protect something? How can we properly protect something that we don't know? The Earth is changing really fast, and we are not letting excuses like it's hard to get there, it's hard to study. We're not letting that stop us from learning about this place that makes up well over half of the Earth. So exploration and analysis really provide us the information necessary to start understanding these things and and really start building what we need to move forward. It's going to take critical action and appropriate, appropriately designed management in order to conserve this part of our Earth. For ocean conservation, we really need to collect, connect, and protect. Thank you guys so much. Great stuff. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Jonathan. Our final speaker uses artificial intelligence to catalog bioacoustics in species to learn more about biodiversity. Please welcome Holger Klink.
Hi, I'm exploring nature by eavesdropping, and what I would like to do today is to present a few highlights of projects we're currently working on. First, I would like to take you south to the Central American rainforest, which you can see behind me. And this is what the rainforest sounds like during the night. It's very much uh, driven by the vocalizations, in this case, of um, insects, and we can visualize the soundscape to make more sense of it. Let me briefly talk you through what you're seeing here. So on the x-axis, we have the time. In this case, four days of continuous data we collected in Panama. On the y-axis, we have the frequency or the pitch of the sound. And then color-coded, you can see the intensity of the sound signals we are recording. So in this specific case, we have during the day one cicada species, which makes a real lot of noise. And during the night, we have uh, 10 cricket species, which are calling a lot. Um, but the species we are, or the family of animals we are mainly interested in are katydids. There are about 100 different species of them in the area we're working at. And these are grasshopper-like insects, which are mimicking leaves. You can see they come in various uh, shapes and sizes, and they play a really important role in that ecosystem. A lot of animals, uh, including many of the 80 bat species we have there, but they're even monkeys, which specialize on katydid as their primary food source. So we also call them nature's popcorn. That's really what it comes down to. <laughs> and we believe that by monitoring um, catered richness, as well as the abundance and distribution of catered bits, that is a really good indication for us how well a rainforest ecosystem is doing. And we're using acoustics to obtaining this kind of information. Now I would like to take you even further south. And um, no, first I want to show you uh, what the catered bit sounds like. Um, Katydids produce sounds which are most often not uh, audible to us because they're in their ultrasonic frequency range, but we can manipulate the sound to make it audible to you. So you have two dominant sound sources here. The higher frequency pitch sound, this one that is an echolocating bat who tries to find a katydid to eat it, and then the lower uh, frequency sound which you hear this one. This is a catered, a male catered trying to attract a female. So in collaboration with uh, National Geographic and also Microsoft, we're developing uh, machine learning tools which allow us to extract these calls and species ID uh, catered from our long-term acoustic data sets we're collecting in the tropics. So now I'm going to take you even a little bit further south. Uh, this is the Antarctic Ice Shield. I spent a lot of time down there during my PhD, and I can tell you if you're standing on the ice, there's not a whole lot going on. Maybe the occasional penguin. But listen to what happens when you put an uh, underwater microphone, which we call a hydrophone, underwater. And this is what it sounds like. And in my opinion, this is one of the most amazing soundscapes we have uh, on Earth. These are vocalizations uh, produced by pinnipeds, primarily in this case Weddell seals and leopard seals, which I used to study during my PhD. Marine mammals make a lot of noises underwater and sound travels very efficiently in the water. So really passive acoustics is a go-to tool for us to monitor abundance distribution and also migration of marine mammals, including the endangered ones in the ocean. Now, I would like to bring it back to the uh, temperate regions. I'm at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, so naturally I listen to a lot of birds as well. Um, birds are terrific indicators for ecosystem health, but they're also challenging. It's a taxonomically very diverse group of animals. There are over 10,000 species in the world, and a lot of them produce a variety of vocalizations. Listen to this guy. This is a bird which you can find right now in your backyard here in the DC area. It's a brown thrasher. And this species alone is known to produce over 1,000 different sound types. So you can imagine that makes our automated acoustic analysis uh, a little bit more challenging. Um, they also have a tendency uh, to call on top of each other. This is a very short uh, snippet of sound I recorded in Sapsaka Wood in Issaka, where my laboratory is. And in this case, we have six passerine species vocalizing at the same time during a dawn chorus. And what you can see in here is that a lot of their vocalizations overlap in time and frequency. 
And that's a real challenge for us to tease this really complex soundscape apart and figure out what species are present at a certain location. But using, again, AI and deep learning methods, we have made really great strides in uh, cracking that nut. Um, we're working on a project which is called BirdNet, um, and we're currently training models which are able to differentiate 1,000 bird species, primarily North American species, acoustically. And moving forward, uh, we want to include more Central and South American species uh, in this analysis to bring this tool into the regions where we have time-critical conservation effort. Thank you. This, by the way, is uh, a Weddell seal, so one of those species you heard vocalizing earlier. That was great, Holger. Thanks for that. Thank you. We're going to have a quick panel discussion in just a minute, but before we do, I have a question for you. Sure. So how exactly do katydids vocalize? So katydids obviously don't have a vocal tract like we do. Um, what they do is uh, we call it stridulation. So they're rubbing uh, body parts um, against another. And what they do is they lift up their wings, and at the base of one wing, they have a sharp ridge. And on the uh, base of the second wing, they have a row of knobs. And by rubbing those two against each other, they're producing the stridulation, which uh, causes the wings to vibrate and um, to produce sound. And it's very interesting also like they hear, their ears are just below the knee and the front legs. Mm -hmm. And they're very sensitive to uh, sound intensity. So it's very directional hearing. And what the females do, they can reorient their body and can figure out from which direction the male is calling and then head it to in that direction where the ma male is actually vocalizing. So it's a little bit like Marco Polo, um, just in, <laughs> with, uh, with Katie did. All right, well with that, why don't we invite our panel to the stage here if we can. So there were some themes that each of you hit on. Um, and one I want to go to right away, and particularly, Jonathan, what you showed us in terms of art playing a role in how we think about science and exploration. How do we think about the impacts as technology advances in the field of the human role in the field? You want to start us, Jonathan? Yeah, I think that it's really the transformation comes on a personal level. It's a personal story um, that really can connect people and go through this transformation that we need in how we relate with the natural world. And I see that technology is a great tool, and it is a great tool to connect us all. But what really, we need art as a partner in this process to help to kind of grab people and help people to um, go through these transformative experiences with nature so that they connect and love nature and see themselves, see ourselves as a part of this thing of beauty. Like it's a, it's um, as another kind of a message instead of like, do this or you're all gonna die. It's more just like, hey, you know, we're on this beautiful, there's just so much beauty to discover and kind of um, have that transformation happen and then have the technology connect us so that it's not just separate little things here and there, but we have this opportunity to really have a movement with technology connecting us. And Heather, with your satellite imagery that you're using, you're in extreme environments where you're doing this work. And so there's always been some limitation of how many humans can go into the field. So how do you see this in terms of scale of the research and what we understand? You spoke to a little bit of it in your talk. Sure, absolutely. Well, I think that that technology really expands the uh, umbrella of exploration in a way that I think is sometimes underappreciated, um, particularly when it comes to uh, supporting people who want to be explorers but can't spend six, eight, 12 months in Antarctica. I mean, I, I can find a million penguins in the morning and still get my kid off the bus in the afternoon. And that, <laughs> that I think, really speaks to the power of technology to 
uh, to really grow the community. So, you know, one of our uh, explorers, Sarah Parkak, of course, she's been here before, and she's really using that satellite technology for archaeology. But what she's done is she's really unleashed, you know, a whole army of citizen scientists who are helping to look at the work and better informing where we go for archaeology. How do you see the role of citizens uh, in this technology that you're using? No, absolutely. So we created what we call Be a Penguin Detective on, on a website that we developed. And it turns out that school kids all over the country have really responded to this. And we'll have an entire fifth grade class look for new penguin colonies in satellite imagery. And in fact, we've had brand new emperor penguin colonies that were discovered by citizens out there um, just exploring because they're interested. And it really gives them an opportunity to do exactly what we're doing when we're looking at the, our satellite imagery. So it's a great way to, to scale um, and to get more eyeballs, but also just to get people really excited. So Whitney, you talked about the drop cams, and we're all super excited about what we're seeing from the drop cams. But you also talked about sort of how we send them on ships or if somebody's going here or whatever. How do you see ultimately scaling this work? Um, well, on the deployment side of it, I, I think that you know connecting so that it's not just one team that's got to kind of be doing all, all right. of it. We can't be everywhere. We can't be doing all of that. It really yeah. allows for sort of expanding out so that we can kind of, with some training, there can be people all over the world that are, you know, if they're connected to expeditions going on, then they can start kind of creating their army of, or sending off their army of cameras. And, and really what that allows for is, it allows for, you know, footage, information from a huge network across the globe. Right. It's not just restricted to these tiny areas. Well, you talked about using sort of layers of information and data to begin to get a picture of our deep sea. You have over 200 explorers here, and as I said, from over 50 countries. How do you see the opportunities for collaborating with just the groups here? Yeah, that's a great question because um, the data layers part is really an important part of exploring these relationships because sure, you can get video footage of animals, but really what's going to give us this information is how does that relate to other things? And that can be so many different things. The human element is going to be a huge part in understanding not only you know, how things are now, but how they're going to change in the future. So connecting with explorers that can give us information across the globe about different types of whatever types of information that they are working with, particularly with the human element, whether it's fishing or pollution that's going into rivers, things like that. Um, all of that kind of information can help tell the story of what's going on. So terrific opportunity for explorers here to connect with you and see how they can become part of that network, Absolutely. yes? Yeah. OK. Um, Holger, I don't really understand how you deploy the technology in the forest. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're building very small and inexpensive passive acoustic recorders, which basically just record sound 24-7 to an SD card. So we try to make them as small and in as inexpensive as possible so we can distribute them uh, to as many people as possible. And especially the work we're doing, for example, in Central Africa, um, it takes a, a lot of effort to get into these jungle areas and we have to carry them all in a backpack. So you want to keep it as light as possible. And then we put them out there and let them record for weeks, months at a time. And then typically recover them and then um, use machine learning to analyze the data. But moving forward, we're really interested in applying these machine learning algorithms in more real-time application, especially for gunshots, poaching, those kinds um, of application. Um, it's really important that we get the information to the people who are on the ground very quickly, and that will be the next step for us to apply these methods in a more real-time application. You know, I spoke in my opening remarks about how many great supporters we have in the audience in addition to Explorers. Some have been truly generous with the National Geographic Society, both individuals, corporate partners, Hubbard Council, et cetera. How do you prioritize your areas, and what would you say to some of our supporters if they're interested in helping you scale this work? 
Yeah, I mean, a lot is really technology development, and I really want to give a shout out to some of the high tech industry, which really helps us a lot. So we, you know, we get support from Microsoft with our AI for Earth grant. We're also working on the BirdNet project with Google, and really, it's it's them helping us to push the science to uh, the next level. So we could not do that ourselves. So really, it's this really synergetic collaboration which makes that happen. And um, the more of these tech companies we can help us out, the, the better off we will be. And that was going to be my next question is, how engaged uh, are you with the private sector to bring them in and develop you know, side-by-side -side technologies or tools that can help you in the field? Oh, I, I guess I'll kick things off. So, we, we couldn't do uh, a lot of what we do without working with some of the same tech companies that, that Holger mentioned. So that includes 360 degree camera technology in the field. Um, all of the support that we've had from Microsoft on the AI for Earth project. Um, just amazing opportunities to go out um, to Microsoft headquarters and learn from the very best out there. Uh, so that's been critical not only for me personally, but also for my students to give them that opportunity. Um, it, it is, as, as Holger mentioned, a really nice synergy between conservation and technology and industry all in one. Yeah, we, um, we are partnering with the National Geographic Society Exploration Technology Lab and reaching out to um, different partners like at MIT Media Lab, um, AI companies as well to help try to figure out how to deal with all this um, this data that we have basically is oh, over 35 terabytes of data right now of that video footage and so we're looking for help in how to kind of pipeline the data to make it a little bit more a, a little faster to analyze so we definitely are looking for partners in that yeah because you can imagine when you're looking at video footage of the deep ocean you have to pull data out of that video, so you just have to sit there and watch it. <laughs> and that takes a long time, so we're working with partners to kind of automate that and kind of streamline that, make that a bit faster. You know, one of the criticisms of AI, as much as we love advancements in technology, and especially those we can apply in exploration and conservation, is that it's pattern recognition. And how do you deal with this issue of patterns today and whether they're the patterns they should be or they're just the patterns right now. How do you sort of look at time when you're really dealing with artificial intelligence? Well, this is kind of a, quite a controversial you know, question and an issue. And I would, I guess my feeling is that to the extent that we're able to support conservation, I don't care how it is that we got to that answer. Um, and it might be a, a bit of a black box. But if we can make really good short-term forecasts that are actually meaningful to policymakers, um, that's good enough for me. Because a, a lot of what we do in my lab is that kind of action-ready science. And so however we get there, and um, we may not understand exactly how the models work now, we hope to get there, um, but I think it is improving conservation. So I couldn't help but notice on your slides, there were numerous mentions of guano detection, also known as penguin poo, of exactly. course. <laughs> and we know that that's the trail often followed to tell us where colonies are. Do you see with technology finding other ways forward to you know, uncover where they've been and where they're going? Absolutely. Well, I. I always say, you know, we will never have fewer satellites in the sky than we have right now. Like, we will only get more satellites, more resolution, higher repeat times. And so the future is really bright, and all of the work that we do now investing in how to use those new tools uh, will only continue to grow and blossom in the future. So I absolutely am sure that we'll have better, better sensors uh, more often in the future. Great. And we'll just have to see what, what the technologists develop. Great, I have a question for Holger, but I do want to remind the audience, we're going to have microphones, so we're going to open it up for some questions in just a moment, so please prepare your questions. Um, so Holger, you started with birds, and you've really kind of doubled down on insects. Can you talk about that and sort of how you see insects as kind of the key? Yeah, I'm uh, uh, taxonomically agnostic. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> A lot of the research I, I'm doing is actually in the marine domain, still with uh, marine mammals. But I mean, we're challenging, uh, we're facing different challenges in different environments. And depending what your question is, you need to pick the right species, which helps you to answer that question. 
Um, candidates are uh, a really great group to work with uh, for many reasons. I mean, they really play that important role in the rainforest. And um, they're also a little bit easier than the birds are because typically they only produce one specific call, which is very stereotyped. So from the detection and the classification point of view, it's, uh, it's, it's not as bad of a challenge as birds can be. Great, great. We're going to open it up to the audience now for questions. And I do want to remind you, we're live streaming, so it's very important, if you can, to wait for the microphone before you ask your, ask your question. I think we have one down here in the front. Microphone is coming to you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentations. They were wonderful. Uh, my question is uh, pertaining to the deep sea camera. What is its capability as far as maximum depth? What is the maximum depth that you have accomplished thus far? Is the feedback simultaneous or uh, real life? Or is it uh, subsequently that you get the information? And finally, do you have to have a cable or something to bring it down, you know, such a long depth and then retrieve it? Um, so. The, there are some cameras, and the original models were full ocean depth, and I believe that that camera did go very near to full ocean depth. They've since made them smaller. The rating is about 6,000 meters, and that's because that can reach uh, a lot of the ocean floor. Like, we don't need to go to the trenches every single time. Um, it has no cable, and that's what makes it so portable and awesome, is because you can just program it to record for however long, and then with a weight, um, take it down to the bottom, and then once it is gone through its recording, there's a burn wire that sets it free, and it fl it's buoyant, so it goes up to the surface and then can be retrieved um, at the surface, and then it's near instantaneous, so we're not streaming up, but you just pick up the camera, go plug it into a computer, and look at your, well, okay, a couple hour download or so, but then you can <laughs> look at it. It's near instantaneous. Other questions? It's stationary, yeah, so it's just yeah. thrown over and it sits at the bottom. The back? So, um, I'm, I wanted to make a, a suggestion, which is that you tie the acoustic monitoring to these deep cameras, since there's probably limits <laughs> to what you can detect uh, with those cameras. But I had a nerdier question, which was, <laughs> I'm particularly interested in coelacanths. And I've heard that, I've heard the suggestion that there's many, many species of coelacanths that, and we've just not sampling in the right area. So I was curious if there was any particular project with the cameras looking for coelacanth species? So, sort of. I just came back from the Seychelles um, on an expedition to the Seychelles. So every time the subs got in the water, we were definitely looking for coelacanths. Um, but that's kind of, it would be more kind of opportunistic. It wasn't like we weren't just setting out to look for coelacanths. But that's a good question. We should go back. <laughs> <laughs> There's an opportunity for someone right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other questions? Do you have one in the back there? I'm sorry? OK. Well, I'll fill the air while we're waiting for one. Did we have one back there? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, right here. OK. You mentioned that you needed uh, help on the AI to analyze the video data from the sea. Could you just briefly mention the type of help you need? Yeah. Well, so are you, are you doing pattern recognition, trying to analyze movements of yeah, there's several several um, pieces of that, and we're actually working with a team right now that, um, that for a while they've been building this um, tool that we will be able to use soon. I hope that um, there's the step of simple event recognition, right? So is something moving in the frame? Um, and then you can go the next level of then trying to start categorizing things. Maybe not necessarily you know, species identification. That's still, well, A, that's very difficult with these animals even you know, looking at the footage. But you know, that really needs to be human eyes at this point, looking at that. Um, but yeah, simple event recognition and, and starting to categorize, that really will um, streamline the process quite a bit. And so that's, that's in the works right now. 
Sounds like you guys should talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had a question right behind here. I don't know if the question is still there. OK. Over here, was it? And this will be our last question. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, Heather, how much of the land have you surveyed and how much you haven't surveyed and how many remaining penguin populations is your gut telling you that there are left to be found? So we've surveyed the entire Antarctic coastline and all the sub-Antarctic islands. We now do that um, at least annually, but we, uh, we try and get cloud-free imagery of all of Antarctica's penguin colonies every month, um, but cloud-free being the, the key uh, issue there because many of these areas are absolutely covered in clouds. Uh, we continue to find new penguin colonies all the time. So we found a very large population of chinstrap penguins right next to a colony that we had been surveying for decades. Wow. And then this last season, we're able to get there with drones. And I estimate something in the order of 10 to 20,000 chinstraps uh, on those islands alone. And increasingly, what we're finding are penguins showing up where the glaciers have retreated, and particularly the gentoo penguin, whose populations are growing. They will seed new colonies. So new colonies are actually being established um, because of climate change and because of glacial retreat. And so I expect that we'll continue to find these tiny little new colonies popping up over time. Um, so every year we find something new. And um, as our artificial intelligence sort of computer vision algorithms get better, uh, no doubt uh, we'll be finding them even faster than before. I see Jonathan Bailey smiling over here. So I guess that means the panel has brought out all the things we were hoping to cover here. <laughs> but before we close, I do have one question for the panel. So obviously machines are taking over a lot of life in different places. And what we've been talking about is machines becoming explorers, going into the field. Do we think we might actually have a National Geographic Explorer that's a machine in the future? I think increasingly we're getting National Geographic explorers who are programmers, uh, who program those machines. Because at the, at the end of the day, somebody had to sit there and make those models work. And, and again, I think that kind of speaks to you know, growing, growing the pie for who can contribute to exploration. Comments? I think that that kind of overlooks one of the huge values of explorers, which is the ability, the creativity, and the ability to connect with other explorers and other people. I mean, sure, they're really good at going out in the field and doing what they do, but the strength is really that that human aspect. It was a bit of a tee up for that, Whitney. <laughs> I think one thing we can all agree is that you know when machines and humans combine, that's when we're at our best. And that's certainly true when we're out in the field. So thank you, panel. It's been fascinating. And thank you all. Thank you. Please welcome wildlife filmmaker and National Geographic explorer, Sandish Kadar. Wow, look at this. This is incredible. I was actually hoping we'd stay a little bit longer in space so I wouldn't have to come in front of all of you. This is quite terrifying. Um, see Derek and Jube and uh, Beverly in the audience. This is um, quite a mesmerizing place to be right here with all of you. I remember about more than a decade ago, in 2009, 2008, I was standing in front on the road in 17th Street at this big building, you know, National Geographic, this formidable fortress. I used to walk in, and the security guard used to look at me. I used to quickly go to the bookstore. I didn't have anyone to meet. <laughs> I didn't know how to get in. <laughs> and with that security around, it was just so terrifying. So this is great with the Explorer's Symposium that all of you can get in and have a run of the house. I wish this existed 10 years ago. <laughs> Anyhow, so that awe and wonder, we're all here traveling on spaceship Earth, and we're all traveling together. And it's very exciting to be here as part of the symposium. And it's a week of incredible inspiration. We're going to be inspired by each other. We're all here to listen to stories. And in the words of Tyrion Lannister, there's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story, <laughs> right? So a quick show of hands here. How many people are here for the first time? 
Wow, that's a good number. Okay, veterans, it's time to welcome the newcomers. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Now, the Explorers Symposium is not really your typical symposium. You know, a bunch of boring talks. This is a coming together. This is a family coming together to share stories with each other. And that's what makes it special. Once you're here, that feeling of family is very important. And 130 years ago, can you imagine that um, this storytelling has been going on continuously, nonstop, for such a long time? And now, with the power of what we have in our pockets, right, we've got a whole live stream audience watching us here today. So let's have a big wave to our live stream audience out there. Yeah. And all of you should join the story to, uh, with Nacho Fest, the hashtag. And that's going to send and amplify each one's story out into the world. Can you imagine Alexander Graham Bell having thought about this when he made his first phone call? Right? That you can reach over 100 million people. National Geographic has over 100 million followers on Instagram, the most followed brand in the world as of a few months ago. That is pretty incredible. And all of you are part of the story to get that, to get that big following, to, to reach audiences like never before. So thank you for that. And what I want to do now is to get people on stage as quickly as possible and get this momentum going. Um, we've now heard about all of the different technologies out there. We've, we've been able to uh, analyze data in ways that we've never been able to before. And that leads us nicely into our next topic, looking at lesser known species and why they are important to our world. Humans share this earth with a spectacular variety of life. Yet estimates suggest that more than 80% of species remain unknown. And that doesn't even include bacteria, things that even run life. And this lack of data and information makes it difficult to manage and conserve our planet's resources. With more than a million species on the verge of extinction, we need to act rapidly or they will be gone forever. And most will remain completely unknown. Eminent biodiversity scientist E.O. Wilson has called for a boots on the ground renaissance to close the gap between the number of estimated species and those described by science. In honor of Wilson's contributions to the field and in celebration of his 90th birthday yesterday, many of you were there, National Geographic is launching an ambitious effort to discover and describe new species, as well as better understand poorly known groups of organisms, which will lead to a better understanding of our planet and improve our ability to conserve our world's biodiversity. This effort will focus support in the most promising places for discovering new species using three approaches, traditional expeditions, citizen science, and artificial intelligence. So we have three new um, requests for proposals on the grants website. And we want to recognize and thank our supporting partners and contributors on these new grant opportunities. Microsoft, the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation, and the Greg Carr Foundation. Let's give them all a big round of applause. So my father studied under Professor Wilson many, many decades ago. My father's an entomologist. And right now, it's, a, it's an honor to be talking about um, Professor Wilson's request for his birthday month. And we need all of your help to do this. So E.O. Wilson is asking all of us to contribute to a birthday gift of biodiversity data by taking a walk in the woods with the family, by going to your neighborhood park, and all you have to do is use your phone, document what you see, however big, however small, and put these observations on iNaturalist or Map of Life. These are apps on your phone that you can download, and your observations will add to the, that big pool of biodiversity. And that's what we need to better care for our planet. So I hope all of you will join in doing this for E.O. Wilson.
Thank you. Now, I'm pleased to bring on our next group of speakers, each of whom work on some very cool animals. First up is the founder and executive director of the Rwanda Wildlife Conservation Association, Olivier Insingimana. He is also a National Geographic explorer. Welcome, Olivier. Thank you. Last time I was here in DC, I had the chance to be on stage. You know what I did? I came flying, just like that. Many people have been asking me, do you still fly? The answer is, yes. I fly every day and I enjoy it. And I hope today many of you will join me in this adventure. Anyway, let me tell you about my long journey to flying. When I was a young boy, my friends and I ran around and explored everything around us. We climbed trees. We went deep into the marshland and we jumped. We had a lot of fun. We'd go through the thorns, through the shrubs, just to see birds. I could tell you for hours about our adventures with birds, but today I want to tell you about one special bird, the gray crowned crane. I remember watching them when I went to collect water for my family down at the bottom of the hill at the valley. This was a highlight of my childhood. We would watch them dancing, hear them calling. I always wanted to fly like them. You can't imagine how many times I made pretend feathers so that I can fly like them. I tried to fly and I fell down, and I fell, and I fell down. I would go home with injuries and my parents would ask me, Olivier, what happened to you? But I wouldn't tell because I wanted to try again and again <laughs> and again. And because I believed anything is possible. As I was growing up, I slowly lost my hope to flying, sad. I thought I would never be able to fly like a crane. Ladies and gentlemen, my country Rwanda is so beautiful that anyone can wish to be a bird to enjoy these, view these views. But unfortunately, my country is one of the highly populated in Africa. Densities have reached over 500 people per square kilometers. And this does not make, make it easy for conservation. On my left, this is a photo of the Volcanoes National Park. And it is clearly shows you the line of how people have pushed with agriculture. In 94, when genocide happened in my, in my country, it ruined the country. I was nine years old. After genocide, I wanted to contribute to, build, to rebuilding my country. My very first job was to be a gorilla doctor. One dream job. For the first time, I felt like I was contributing to rebuilding my country by saving a critically endangered species in my country. But guess what? I wasn't flying. My heart was not in the right place. I started exploring what was happening with the great crown cranes. And this is what I found. With less than 500 cranes in my country, if nothing was done, we could lose all of them. So what's happening, great crown cranes have, have been losing most of their habitat. But in addition, this is happening. There is a huge demand for pet trade. Many people want to have them in their gardens, in hotels, as pets. So local communities driven by poverty and lack of awareness, they are hunting, poaching, and selling to those who want to have them. So cranes, when they end in captivity, people cut feathers to stop them from flying. They never make good pets. And we lose a huge number of cranes by malnutrition. People don't know how to care for them, and stress, and most, most important, these cranes, they can't breed in captivity. So we've lost, we've lost a huge number of cranes. So when I became aware of this, I told myself, I'm, I'm gone, I have to do something about it. So that's when I founded an organization to help these cranes with our ultimate goal to stop the illegal trade and remove all the captive cranes. We have been implementing a number of strategies. I can't say it all, like it's so much of activities. But today I want to tell you about one strategy. Um, it's illegal to keep cranes in, a, in, in, in a captivity in my country. But 
when I saw that people really love them, they want to have them, or, and they are not aware of the consequences, we, I decided just to go in with awareness. So we launched a media campaign. We went on radios, television, and we told the people, did you know the crimes that we love could disappear? Did you know that our grandkids, our great grandkids might not be able to see the crimes? And the, I told them, if you really, really love crimes, and you want to give the, them a second chance, Let's do something about it. I opened my phone, my private phone number to the whole country. I said, <laughs> like, please call me if you want to register to tell me you have a crane. So many people have been calling me voluntarily. We have registered about 288 cranes. And when we register, these people accept that we can take these cranes. So we've been taking them, confiscating them. Not confiscating them, but people have accepted. So when we take them, we put them under quarantine, health checks. And the purpose of this is to identify cranes that can have a second chance to go back to the wild. And when the quarantine is finished, this is what happens. Today we'll be hitting 100 cranes in the wild. When you see them running, and some of them flying, it's a huge relief. It's worth the effort, it's worth the hard work. Cranes? They like to flock up, to find food together, fly together. And every time I see them, it reminds me how, like, as human, we need to work in a team. We can't succeed with everything we are doing without working together. Ladies and gentlemen, for a long time, I felt like I would never be able to fly. But recently, I found something. Um, every time I release the captive cranes, I see them flying. I close my eyes and I fly with them. I can fly. But I want to tell you something good that has been happening. We've released about 156 cranes into the wild, and these constitute 30% of the whole population of cranes in my country. And this is not only the only thing that is happening. These cranes, they are coupling and they're having chicks. And this gives me the hope for the gray crown cranes in my country. Sadly, during the whole process, we've come across a huge number of cranes that are disabled. Many people have accidentally or purposefully broken the wings so that these cranes will never be able to fly. We have over 50 cranes that are in these conditions. But the good news, the government has given us use of 21 hectares in a capital city. And we want to transform this place into a crane area, a Mustambi village. It's like a great crown crane village. And we want to build a huge environmental education center. We want to educate the large community in Rwanda. And this means we can achieve our goal of not having any cranes, any captivity, and we can end the trend. So if you ever want to fly, if you have ever wanted to fly, please join me. Together, we can end the trade in Grey Crown Cranes. Together, we can give a hope to the Grey Crown Cranes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. What an incredible story of hope. Next. Please welcome 2019 National Geographic Buffett Award for Conservation Leadership recipient, Patricia Medici. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a taper. This is a lowland taper. This is the animal I'm passionate about. This is the most incredible animal on the face of the earth. <laughs> There's, I'm not open for discussion. <laughs> this is the, the largest land mammal in South America. They can weigh up to 250 kilos. They're massive. They're gorgeous. Um, they live throughout South America in uh, 11 different countries, 21 different ecoregions, many different habitat types, forests, grasslands, uh, floodplains. They're very plastic animals. They can be found in all kinds of habitats. They're closely associated with water. Uh, they're excellent swimmers. They're fantastic swimmers. They swim super fast. They're nocturnal. They're solitary. Very, very elusive animals. Very difficult to, to see a taper in the wild. Very, very difficult. They're herbivores, 100%. 50% of their diet consists of fruit. And uh, when they eat fruit, they swallow the seeds. 
and they disperse those seeds throughout the landscape through their feces. And they have this major, major, extremely important role in shaping and maintaining biodiversity. And for that reason, they're known as the gardeners of the forest. So if tapirs go extinct, forests, habitats will be very, very different from what they are right now. Um, this is a baby tapir. <laughs> the watermelon, the cutest animal offspring in the animal kingdom. <laughs> there is no competition, again, not open for discussion. Um, and uh, what makes tapers so charismatic, um, it's pretty much the baby taper. So we use these pictures a lot. Um, and this is the problem. Not many people actually know what a taper is. Many people think this is a taper. <laughs> This is not a taper. This is a giant anteater. Tapers do not eat ants. They do not eat thermites. Never, ever. I told you, they eat fruit. Um, the people who do know what a taper is, uh, particularly in Brazil, they actually associate tapers with lack of intelligence. And that's a whole different problem. Because in Brazil, if you want to call somebody, let's say, stupid, uh, you will call that person a taper. It's more or less like, like here in the US, like calling somebody a jackass. Um, so that's a, that's a huge public relations problem that we, we're trying really hard, working really hard to try <laughs> and solve, and it's only in Brazil, and we don't really know where it comes from. We're trying to, to figure that out. Um, so since 1996, we have been working throughout the country in all the different biomes where tapers are found in Brazil. Uh, we have established research and conservation programs in the Atlantic Forest, in the Pantanal, in the Cerrado, and right now at this very moment, we're establishing our fourth and final program in the Brazilian Amazon. And we work mostly outside of protected areas and private land where we're most needed. In, um, in each one of the regions, in each one of the biomes, we identify and make assessments of all the different threats affecting tapers in that particular region, which usually includes habitat destruction. Um, road kill is a very serious problem for tapers throughout Brazil, throughout South America, pesticide contamination, and, uh, and poaching. So once we have that information, once we, we finish those assessments, we have all the data we need to design and implement uh, local strategies for their conservation in all these different regions throughout the country. And over the years, over the past 20, 23 years, we have captured, we have radio collared, we have monitored hundreds of tapers throughout the country. So we have tons, tons and tons of information coming in every day. And uh, those pieces of information, they're extremely important to us to help us design those conservation strategies that I mentioned before, make them effective, make them realistic for each one of the different regions we're, we're dealing with. But it's not all about um, the science. Uh, at some point in, the, in our history, we realized that we were doing amazing science. We were collecting fantastic data. We were designing all these amazing conservation strategies. We were publishing. We were presenting in conferences. But we were more or less preaching to the converted. We were not talking to the public. So we decided that communication had to be a big component of the work we do in Brazil. And Brazil is huge. We have lots of people in my country. So um, a good uh, part of our energy uh, is spent communicating, talking to the general public, using all the different tools that are available out there, um, uh, social media networks, art, photography, film, um, TV, Brazilians love television, the press. We use everything we can to talk to the public um, as often as possible to spread the word about the taper conservation cause as widely as possible in Brazil mostly, but also internationally. And uh, Brazil is going through several important changes right now. I'm sure you're all aware of that. We have a new so-called president in the country. Um, and all our, our conservation environmental agencies, all our legislation, all our environmental policy, everything is being dismantled, completely dismantled by the minute as we speak. Um, and all of us, uh, 
conservationists in Brazil and around the world, we have to stand up for this fight. We have to speak up. We have to make sure we'll be heard throughout this process. We know it's going to be hard and painful, um, but we have to do that. And speaking for myself, all I can say is that I will keep doing uh, whatever I can. I'll do whatever it takes to make sure that these animals and all the habitats where they're still found will not go extinct. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. I'd love to go see a taper out there in the wild. Wouldn't you? Yeah. So if you're joining us tomorrow night for the awards program um, uh, dinner, you'll have a chance to hear even more about Patricia, Patricia's incredible work. Our last speaker for this session is a very familiar face for many of you. We call him the Batman around here because he really is the real Batman. And he's always available to advise you on your best choice of tequila. <laughs> Join me in welcoming biologist and National Geographic explorer at large, Rodrigo Medellin. Thank you. No, I don't fly either. I do not fly. So when the National Geographic asked me to share some stories and some lessons about how to put a species on the map, I immediately started thinking, well, what map? What is the map? So this is the result of the reflections that I've been going through since they asked me. And it's a, it's a joy that I hope that I'll be able to convey some of these lessons to you all. Oops, I have to go back. Um, this situation of putting a species on the map is not an easy thing to do because you have to start from how do, you, how do you begin by finding a species. I'm going to talk about two cases, two species, two different species. Um, when you choose a species, you don't choose the species because it's very beautiful or because it's very charismatic. In fact, most of the time, the species chooses you. And they choose you by instigating passion and by posing incredible questions and fascinating challenges that you really want to get in, engaged in. And that you feel that you may have a little bit of a solution for the problems that are affecting those species. So it's really the opposite. The, the species chooses you. When you're talking about, uh, about bats, can you believe that there's people who are horrified about bats? How can that possibly be? But unfortunately, it is true. However, there's many ways in which you can turn the tide around and make people adore bats. And I'm talking about when you're talking to uh, kindergartners or senators or governors or whatever, local communities, anybody. You start talking about the ecosystem services that bats provide to you and to them, and the fact that bats touch every day of your life, and then they start, uh, they start figuring out, oh yeah, bats are not that horrifying after all. This is exactly the message that we need to convey. Um, when you work on bats, you have to do a lot of research. You have to work with many maps. What are the maps that you're working on? This is just one collection of maps, but there's so many other maps. In this case, it's the federal government and the industry and the multilateral environmental uh, uh, agencies. But you also have to work with the local communities, with the children in the schools, and so on and so forth. And each of those is one different map. And you have to work on those and many other maps. So you have to put your species on all of those maps. Uh, shifting gears, let's go to the jaguar. Jaguars have a very uh, powerful and positive image already to begin with, right? People like jaguars, right? However, jaguars get in trouble very often. <laughs> they attack cattle, and that is a problem that we created ourselves because we invaded the land of the jaguar, and we put these animals in front of them, and we removed their original prey, and we're asking them not to touch our animals. Well, I'm sorry. That is a problem that we created. 
Um, to do this, to, to solve these problems, you have to do a lot of research. And research involving finding out what are, the, what are the movements of the animals, what is the spatial ecology, the diet of the animals. Here you can see a member of my team, Antonio de la Torre, who is probably here in the audience, I hope somewhere here. That's right, he's not here, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> But he is one of the top jaguar experts in the world, and with him we've done a lot of this work. Once you have your science in place, please, please publish. If you publish, you are going to have the respect of your peers, and you're going to have the credibility of science. But publishing is not all. And to paraphrase Sir Winston Churchill, Publishing is not the end. Publishing is not even the beginning of the end. Publishing is the end of the beginning. We need to sit down with a, every, every group of stakeholders and work with them. Get each and every one of your lessons, digest it, and put it in their hands so that they can get your science and your findings and they can put them in their, in their everyday practices or into public policy, or both. But if you don't have the science there and if you don't have the publishing there, then you don't have the credibility. You have to have both. Some of the results that we have achieved over the years in the case of the bats is, number one, that bats are now stable. All of, the, all of the colonies that we've been following for the past 30 years are either stable or growing, and we have new colonies in many places. We have delisted a species of bat, and we're in the process of working towards delisting several other species of bats. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. We have achieved uh, the rooting of the outreach and education. Today, we are not the only ones. By far, we're not the only ones that are talking about bats in a positive light. There's many other people that are doing this. And this is exactly the commitment, the, the, the commitment that we want to instigate in the Mexican public and everywhere else. There's also a new generation of conservation scientists already working in their own countries, in Mexico, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, and many of the places where we've been working. So this is really putting a species on the map. In the case of the jaguars, we have a very strong program on jaguar compensation in which responsible ranchers get their money whenever a jaguar attacks a, uh, a head of cattle, if they have respected the original prey of the, of the jaguar, if they did not hunt any, any jaguars either, and if they're not deforesting. If they do that, I am very happy to report that this year we celebrated case number 400 in which the federal government of Mexico paid compensation because of these responsible ranchers that are working with us for the conservation of the jaguar. Ten years ago, we achieved the fact that Mexico became the first country in the world to have an estimate of how many jaguars do we have. And because of us doing a second national jaguar survey last year, we can now report that the jaguar population grew by 20% last year to 4,800 jaguars in all of Mexico. So that is a, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, it's putting the species on the map on a much bigger way. Um, you need to get out of your comfort zone. Being there an academic, I never dreamed that I would be working in the multilateral environmental agreements. So it took me a big effort to get out of there and start working in CITES. You have to get out of your comfort zone. We have to create and enable communities of change. We need to do that. Do not take yourself too seriously. <laughs> Don't take yourself too seriously. Come down of the ivory tower. You are just one more human being. And you can interact with everyone else. Having a PhD is absolutely nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you have to come down from the ivory tower. Work with other sectors. Reach out. If you're an academic, 
work with the governments. If you're a local practitioner, work with academics, et cetera, et cetera. And never, ever give up. Thank you very much. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you, Rodrigo. Now that we've gotten to know a few cool species, I'm very excited to introduce you to a one very, very cool animal that all of you will get to experience right here. But before that, let's watch this short video. Our next group of speakers are here to share much more information about the charismatic Sumatran rhino. To introduce them, our moderator is the Senior Director of Wildlife at National Geographic Society, where she oversees the grants portfolio for wildlife research and conservation projects. Please welcome Catherine Workman. The Sumatran rhino holds several rhino superlatives. It's the smallest, the hairiest, the most vocal, the closest living relative of the extinct woolly rhinoceros, and it's the most threatened of the five living rhino species. Its home is in the Sundalin hotspot, one of Earth's most biologically rich yet threatened terrestrial areas. Historically, it was found across Malaysia and Indonesia, and as far north on the mainland perhaps as China and Bangladesh. Today, however, wild Sumatran rhinos are restricted to the forests of Indonesia, mostly on the island of Sumatra, as well as also on Kalimantan, the Indonesian side of the island of Borneo. Now, it's a tough species to survey because they're mostly solitary animals, but population estimates, as you just saw, are less than 80 individuals, and the population is decreasing. In fact, experts now consider isolation to be the single biggest threat to the species. Animals aren't finding each other to mate, and so they're not making enough rhino babies, something that our uh, panelists will elaborate on in just a minute. So why convene a panel on the Sumatran rhino? Well, this species represents an incredible amount of evolutionary history, being the only living member of the most primitive group of rhinos that emerged 15 to 20 million years ago. Should this small, hairy, singing species blink out, it would be the first extinction of a full mammalian genus since the Tasmanian tiger disappeared in 1936. But there's a more optimistic reason for us to have our conversation today, and that is that in partnership with the Indonesian government, the conservation community has united in an unprecedented effort to bring this species back from the brink. Should the effort succeed, this heralds a new model of conservation moving forward. So to talk about that effort and all things Sumatran rhino, we have a great panel for you. I do want to say very sadly that the National Geographic fellow on this project, whose name is Rudy Putra, and who himself hails from the island of Sumatra, was unfortunately unable to join us at the very last minute. So Rudy will not be on the panel today. But we have four terrific folks who I'm going to introduce now. So Colby Bishop is the manager of programs, wildlife programs, for the National Geographic Society. Corey Jaskowski is a conservationist and National Geographic Labs Fellow. Kira Milam is the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the IUCN Species Survival Commission. And Cece Sievert is the Deputy Director of the International Rhino Foundation. Please welcome our panelists. Welcome, guys. 
Uh, Cece, we're going to start with you on the end there, All right. because you and your organization, the International Rhino Foundation, IRF, for this conversation, have been working on Sumatran rhino conservation for decades. So introduce everyone here um, in the audience and online to the species. Sure. Thanks. Um, so the Sumatran rhino is a species on the brink of the extinction. Um, some even consider it the most endangered land mammal on Earth. Um, there are fewer than 80 individuals, as you said, and they are distributed across, um, mostly in Sumatra, across 10 small subpopulations. And some of these subpopulations are so tiny, they're as small as two or three individual animals. Uh, the Sumatran rhino um, uh, is, so it's isolated. And in addition to that, with a small number, the third problem is that the females have a reproductive pathology. So the longer the females go without breeding, um, the more likely they are to grow tumors or cysts in the reproductive tract. So the problem is the longer they are isolated, the less likely they are to successfully breed if they do have the opportunity to um, come together and, and have a, a reproductive um, act. <laughs> 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 Well put, G-rated version. <laughs> so anyway, so, um, so looking at this species, back in 2015, a group of scientists came together and they did what's called a population viability analysis. And they looked at all these factors, like the small population and genetic um, and demographic changes. And they realized that any population that's smaller than 15 animals um, will essentially just sort of die off in a quiet way, wither off into existence. And, um, and that is all based on zero poaching and zero human. <laughs> Little no, that's okay. <laughs> so that's zero poaching and zero um, human mitigated threats. So uh, these tiny populations are highly at risk of just disappearing into nowhere. In the absence of other threats just by the very nature of their isolation. Right, right. So if they aren't brought together, if they aren't breeding regularly in a larger population, then we're going to lose this whole species. And we're actually going to lose the whole genus, because it's, a, it's not just a species, it's an entire genus. Yeah. Yeah, so Kira, given that, um, what Cece just laid out for us, what is the Sumatran rhino rescue effort? How was this conceived? Who's involved? And um, what is this effort trying to achieve? Sure. Um, so as Cece said, there's been decades of science and efforts to save Sumatran rhino, but they just really weren't as a species stepping back from that extinction cliff, despite many fantastic efforts. And so what we needed was one strategy, a one plan approach that brought the governments and the NGOs and the global scientific community together to work as one team to save the Sumatran rhino. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, um, the world community of, science, of rhino experts worked with the Indonesian government officials to really come to an agreement that the only strategy at this point in time to save Sumatran rhinos was to find those isolated populations and relocate them into specifically built designed breeding facilities to really grow the population with the intention of once the population has grown, getting them back out there into the wild. And so last year, we came together um, in a project, a, a groundbreaking collaboration led by the Indonesian government. Unfortunately, there's no one here from the Indonesian government partnership um, representing today, but we would like to express our heartfelt thanks for the leadership in this initiative. But we brought together five founding organizations in the National Geographic, the IUCN Species Survival Commission, International Rhino Foundation, and also in the room today, um, World Wildlife Fund, WWF, and Global Wildlife Conservation. So these five conservation organizations came together with the Indonesian government to create an alliance that would work together with conservation organizations on the ground, so implementing partners with technical experts around the world, bringing together veterinary expertise, technology expertise, husbandry, communication, fundraising, to really work on one plan. And so from that, we've created the alliance. Each of those partners have put in a million dollars each, but towards a much larger fundraising goal with a commitment to work together to reach that goal and work with all of those partners to make sure that this effort is a success. And what is that? What's the timeline of that? 
So we're, we've got an ambitious three-year fundraising timeline, but obviously this project is much longer than that. The implementation plan at the moment spans five years, and we're one year in, so another four years. Um, but obviously we're working very closely with the Indonesian government on a rescue and breeding effort. So this sits within a wider Indonesian government initiative of a national breeding strategy for Sumatran rhino. So the intention is to bring those rhinos in, establish these facilities. So there are three objectives for the project. One is to build two new centres, one in Indonesian Borneo, one in northern Sumatra, and to expand the existing um, facility in Way Campus National Park in southern Sumatra. And then to find these rhinos, relocate them into these centres, and then establish a breeding program, working through the challenges that Cece just mentioned with their reproductive pathology, and then work with the Indonesian government and the communities and implementing partners to ensure that it can be carried into the long term for the survival of the species. Excellent. Great, thanks. So Colby, as your vantage, um, uh, from your vantage, I guess, as Director of Wildlife Programs, what role did you see for National Geographic here? What, um, what contributing value did Geographic want to add to this alliance? Yeah, definitely. So as Kira and Cece set up for us, over decades of research have, and science have gone into figuring out how, how the Sumatran rhino works. We know how to take care of it in a sanctuary. We know how Sumatran rhinos can mate and how to successfully breed them in a sanctuary. So National Geographic's unique role on this effort is to put the Sumatran rhino on the map. And we just had a fabulous panel talking about bringing these lesser known species, species that maybe people haven't heard about, live in faraway places, there's only 80 left. Our job is to take pictures like this. This is Joel Sartori's photo arc image of a Sumatran rhino. So people can look into the eyes of these species that maybe they've never seen before, see the hair on its back, and get, get to know it. We, um, we just had our storytelling team down at, one of, at the sanctuary in Way Campus in Indonesia. And they were there to film with the seven Sumatran rhinos that live there, but also to get to know and tell the stories of the keepers that work so closely with the Sumatran rhinos and the veterinarians that live on site with the rhinos to make sure that they're healthy. And then of the surrounding communities as well that have community gardens to help feed the rhinos. So our job really is to tell the 20 million years of evolutionary history that's at stake and gain public support and get everyone involved on this important effort. Oh, very cool, well said. Uh, Corey, you have an interesting resume. Um, you have 3D <laughs> scanned the Tomb of Christ. You've digitized uh, the mummified remains of a dinosaur in Canada. So what exactly, um, what exactly is the contribution of your role of technology, <laughs> your type of technology to this Sumatran rhino rescue effort? Good question. So I've been developing uh, technologies for exploration and scientific study with National Geographic for about 10 years. And while doing this, I realized that there's another critical use of these technologies and that's to be able to show people some of these places we work in, in a different light, in a way using these technologies that they couldn't otherwise experience. And my team and I have built some pretty wild things. We've built uh, color night vision cameras to look up in the trees of jungles to see nesting chimpanzee families and see how they interact at night. We've built um, deep water systems that have been able to go miles back in caves and take underwater images, some of the highest resolution underwater images of the world um, of these incredible places. And even uh, equipment to work in really harsh environments like to take time lapses from everywhere from Mount Everest to Antarctica for the extreme ice program. But you know, following along with this mission, a couple years ago, we started doing 3D scanning, mostly of cultural and big natural places um, that are in danger in some fashion so that we can preserve and protect and share them. So we scanned, as you mentioned, the Tomb of Christ, um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was part of a big museum exhibit here at National Geographic. We've scanned the entire Nabataean city of Petra, Jordan, um, in submillimeter resolution. All of Chichen Itza, in interior of all the buildings, tombs that hadn't been accessed for 100 years, with my friend Guillermo Dianda, and natural places like the Okavango River Delta, about 1,000 square kilometers of that, and 1,000 square kilometers of Gramba in the National Park in DRC with my friend Naftali Honig, and they're using that at African parks for anti-poaching efforts. So with all these crazy big places that we've scanned, you might think that when National Geographic contacted me and said, hey, do you think you could 3D scan a living Sumatran rhino? That, <laughs> that maybe that would have sounded easy, but uh, it, it didn't. I almost, almost said no, actually. <laughs> so the challenge there is, is that when we're scanning these, these uh, cultural sites, like big rock temples, 
they're basically the same for years and years and years at a time. So our normal method of scanning is to bring six or eight people to a site and work at it for a month to do this big area 3D scan at submillimeter resolution. But the problem with living animals, of course, is that they move. Yeah. And so we basically have to do the same scan that we do in these big places, but do it in a millisecond. So you know that, that scared me quite a bit, but I knew that if we managed to pull this off, that we'd have something incredible. We'd have not just, um, we'd have an experience of the rhino that if we digitized the rhino, made a digital copy, and did video reference for all the motion analysis, we'd have something we could share with the world and give everybody an up-close look at the rhino and give them a way to be inspired and to share the rhino that they'll probably never be able to see uh, in the wild. We thought this could be so much more than a flat image. We thought this could, um, actually, maybe we could even take the rhino and we could put it in the room with you. You could hear its footsteps. You could hear its vocalization and get the experience of it walking next to you. <laughs> so meet Harapan, the Sumatran rhino. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, how the heck uh, did you make that happen? Well, um, so we traveled on site. My wife and I traveled to Sumatra, where we worked with the uh, Sumatran Rhino Rescue there. Um, to actually 3D scan the creature. So we, instead of doing a single his name's Harapan. camera, Harapan, yep. Instead of using a single camera and lots of people, we used lots of cameras. <laughs> so we could set them all up outside of the enclosure that he voluntarily goes in every day, uh, lured by watermelon, um, to receive veterinary care. So these bars were nice and wide apart, so we could actually put our camera system outside of them, looking through the bars of the enclosure so the rhino wouldn't destroy our cameras, which was a big concern. And uh, you know, it rained hard every day, so we had this tarp over the top that was already part of the enclosure that we could keep the cameras dry. But we set up this array of 18 cameras in this case, all high resolution still cameras. And our idea was is that we could fire them all at the exact same time and capture a 3D scan in the same fashion that we would um, one at a time for a big archeology span site. So we set up this big array of cameras, um, pointed at the rhino, and got them all focused at where we would think the rhino would stand. And this is part of the hard part, right? Getting a, uh, a large rhino to stand exactly where he wanted to is not necessarily easy. But fortunately, he's very food motivated, and uh, he loves watermelon. <laughs> so, Aren't we all? <laughs> exactly. So we were able to get that done. And um, so Anne's in the enclosure there as we're doing focus tests. So she's standing exactly where we want the rhino to stand. And these all tether back to a group of boxes that synchronize the cameras to within a millisecond from each other so that we can fire the button at once and capture the rhino from every angle. And just like your two eyes give you stereo vision by the interocular distance of your eyes, we basically had 18 cameras. So we had 18 factorial, which is a really big number, of, uh, of eyeballs, eye pairs of eyes looking at the rhino, developing a 3D scan of him. And because we were doing it from one side, we'd take an image of him from one side and then have the watermelon move to the other side so we'd have him turn around. <laughs> and piece by piece, we built up this entire scan of the rhino. So you can see the uh, 3D model that we came out with here. And then you are, as you already saw, we can animate the rhino and bring him back to life. We built up a virtual Sumatran jungle to place him back in so that people could experience him in his environment. And when you're done here, if you go across to the cafeteria, we have a large 3D dome with glasses that you can experience the rhino in the Sumatran jungle. So it was a pleasure and an honor to work with this amazing animal. And uh, I hope that by helping you know, share him with the world, we can make more people care about him and continue to protect this amazing animal. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's, really, it's, it's amazing, and it was fabulous to see the front row um, try to <laughs> try to pet Harapan as he passed by. That's incredible, uh, Corey. Really, that is. Um, but Cece, this is not the first time 
that Hairpan has been in the States. Yes. First time in our auditorium here, certainly, but Hairpan has a history in the US. He does. Going back to the 1980s, right? Well, he, well, yeah, he was originally born here, but the whole history of captive Sumatran rhinos goes back to the 80s. Um, back in the 80s, um, scientists were realizing that this population was um, starting to plummet. The numbers were going down, and at that time, the estimated population was anywhere from 400 to 800 individuals. And so in 1984, a group of scientists came together in Singapore and decided that they would capture um, Sumatran rhinos and bring them into zoos around the world to create a um, insurance population, so to speak, so that if, God forbid, the wild population did disappear, we would have a backup population. So approximately, over 10 years, approximately 40 animals were captured, including Harapan's parents. And they were dispersed across zoos all around the world. And um, this was an incredible opportunity because Sumatran rhinos hadn't been in the care of zoos before. So it was an amazing opportunity to learn about both their husbandry and care as well as their nutrition. Because you, know, you think about what a white rhino eats, he's just a big lawnmower in South Africa. And then you think about the landscape that a Sumatran rhino lives in, there's no wide open um, fields of grass. They're eating twigs, they, they love their watermelon. Um, they are very food motivated. But they eat hundreds of different species of plants. So this was an incredible opportunity to learn about this species. So um, unfortunately, uh, we were learning about a lot about the species, but babies were not being born. Um, by 1995, there were only three Sumatran rhinos left in the US. There was one over in LA, and then there were two in the Cincinnati Zoo. And so the decision was made to bring them all together so that we could try and focus our last efforts on, on making rhino babies. Um, at that time, Dr. Terry Roth was hired at Cincinnati, and she had one, to, one main goal, which was to make babies, rhino babies. Um, <laughs> and, sorry, sorry, Terry. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so she, um, they did um, assessments of the animals, and it turns out that one of the females wasn't reproductively viable. So that means they had one male, Ipu, and one female, Emmy. And so um, Terry put all of her efforts into trying to, trying to get a baby out of these to. And so for years, she was doing ultrasounds and trying to figure out what Emmy's cycle was so that they could, they could make this baby. And um, they just could, she was not ovulating. And so what they ended up doing was putting, like, putting them together and seeing what happens. And um, I don't know if any of you have seen rhinos mate. Um, it is not the most gentle act, I'll just say that. Um, females often get quite injured in the process, but um, they really had no other choice. So um, they put the animals together, and miraculously, they got along pretty well. And a few, um, soon thereafter, Emmy actually ovulated. And that's when Terry sort of cracked this whole nut on Sumatran rhino breeding and it's the fact that they are induced ovulators. So most mammals, you know, humans for example, will cycle every 28 days, but Sumatran rhinos only cycle when there is an interaction between the males and females. And this is a huge discovery. So once they figured that out, they figured, all right, we're going to start making rhino babies. And so meanwhile, around the same time, the International Rhino Foundation and our on-the-ground partner in Indonesia, the Rhino Foundation of uh, Indonesia, it's also known as Yabi, um, we established the first Sumatran rhino sanctuary in Wycombus National Park, and that's where Harapan currently lives. And so we had three animals there, but they weren't mating. And so we kept saying, come on, we got to make some babies. So now that um, Terry had finally sort of cracked this nut on the induced ovulation, um, they actually got Emmy pregnant. But then she had a miscarriage. So then they got her pregnant again. And then another miscarriage. And she had five miscarriages. Oh. And we were really losing hope. I mean, these were the last two animals we had to work with in, in captivity. So um, eventually, Terry started Emmy on a hormone therapy, and it worked. And the pregnancy held. And so they just had to wait. The problem is, nobody had had a Sumatran rhino pregnant before, so they weren't quite sure how long they had to wait. So <laughs> turns out, 16 months. <laughs> it takes 16 months to make a rhino baby. <laughs> and so 16 months later, Andalas was born. He was born in 2001. Um, three years later, they had a little girl named Suchi. And then three years after that, in 2007, Harapan was born. So eventually, um, Harry's uh, mom and dad passed away. And his sister died of um, a disease called iron storage disease, which is a significant um, issue for rhinos. But Andalas, um, Harapan's older brother, went back to the SRS in 
2007. And he is now the father of two calves there, um, Andatu and Delilah. Um, you saw Delilah doing some photo bombs um, in, in the background there in the videos. And then um, in 2015, the very difficult decision was made to move Harapan back to Indonesia. And this was moving the last Sumatran rhino out of the United States. But he um, moved to Indonesia. It was a 53-hour journey for him. Um, they rented out an entire ferry because they needed, they didn't want to put him on a short flight, and they, so they drove the truck into the ferry. He had the whole truck by himself because they didn't want to give him exhaust fumes or anything like that, and drove him through the middle of the night into the SRS, and he is a happy camper there. He's, um, he's put on weight. He's um, loving being in his natural environment, and um, we are currently um, working on getting a hairy baby, but it hasn't happened yet, so um, he's practicing with some of the females there. And, um, so if everybody can wish Harry good luck, we need it. <laughs> and so hopefully we'll have some more rhino babies soon. Yeah, and it sounds like the, all the lessons learned back in the 80s about the reproductive biology are now being applied to the current effort of making more Sumatran rhino babies. Absolutely, absolutely. Without the years of research and studying and husbandry and care of these animals, we wouldn't be able to succeed. Yeah, that's great. Good story. <laughs> um, Kira, I'm thinking that um, we might have some folks in the crowd that are perhaps skeptical of, of the approach and, and wonder, you know, there's so few of them. Is this a last-ditch a last effort um, to save this species? So first of all, how would you respond to them? And then if you would also put it in the broader context of other captive propagation efforts to, to save endangered species. Sure. Uh, Catherine, what I would say to them is that the state of the species that we share this planet with are, is in crisis. I, we've heard from the UN report a few weeks ago that there are a million species slipping towards extinction. And so we are seeing this situation with more and more species. And the, but the good news is that we know that it works. Um, so there are a number of species now that have been brought back from very small numbers. For example, the Mauritian kestrel. Back in 1970, there were just four birds left four birds, two breeding pairs. But thanks to the dedicated, coordinated efforts of a team of people, um, they were able to breed those birds and get them back, and now there are 300 flying around Mauritius. Mm -hmm. The scimitar horned oryx similarly was declared extinct in the wild by IUCN in 2000. Thanks to a really coordinated effort by the governments, by teams of zoos all around the world, and by global expert communities, they've been reintroducing scimitar horned oryx now back into Chad, and there are now 100 individuals, and they're on track to reach a goal of 500 back in the wild in the next few years. Okay. So we know that this happens. There's a longer, longer list of black-footed ferrets, American bison, Californian condor, Many of them are stories that we know. Um, but the trick is really working together as one team. And all of us, all of us fighting to save species from extinction around the world, the end game, the point of success, is having healthy populations back in the wild in thriving habitats with functioning ecosystems. But there are many different tools that we need to use and many different types of expertise to get us there. And often when we just work with one organization or with our core community, the, we tend to use the techniques we're most familiar with or the ones that, that, um, that we're strongest in. And so what we really need is these collaborations that bring different expertise together. And um, sometimes that's habitat protection, sometimes it's anti-poaching patrols, sometimes it's bringing them into, into human care. Often it's a combination of all of those. And what we, what we do see quite often is a hesitation to bring animals into human care as though it's some implication that we've failed at protecting them in the wild. But we've just heard from Cece that this is a science. It takes a long time and lots of really, really dedicated expertise to figure out how to capture an animal, how to keep it alive, how to care for it, how to breed it, how it, how it performs reproductively. Um, and there's lots of nuance into that. And we need, we need time. We need time and experts working together to figure out those solutions. And we have recently seen some devastating consequences of what happens when we leave it too late. There was an example just uh, two years ago now, a little melamese, a little rodent off of, um, the, uh, off of, on an island off the coast of northeast Australia. Um, the island was going underwater because of ri rising sea levels. And they knew this. And the habitat for this mouse was shrinking. And the scientific community and the government community of Australia debated what to do about this for five years. They finally decided to bring some into, into human care. It took six months to approve the permits, and a few weeks before the expedition to go and capture some of these, some of these mice, a huge storm surge came, washed the island underwater, and we've lost that, we've lost that species. 
And similarly, um, the vaquita porpoise is a very small porpoise in the Gulf of California. Many of you will know that really harrowing story. We waited until there were 30 individuals left, and we didn't know a thing about how to capture them, how to keep them alive, how to breed them. And despite really valiant, incredible efforts from a global team, that effort is not currently succeeding, and we, that, the future of that, of that porpoise is really in, in strife as well. So the secret here is that we know it can work. It really does. We just need to work together as a collaboration, and we need to start early. We can't wait until it's the 11th hour. Yeah, that sense of urgency is it's really pressing. Thank yeah. you. Um, OK, so Colby, what is the state of the Sumatran rhino rescue effort? Um, where are you all right now in the project, and, and what does it look like for the next five years of this partnership? Yeah, so um, right now in the three areas in Indonesia where we know there are rhinos in the wild, we're doing surveys to figure out where exactly the best place is to dig the pit traps to rescue them and bring them into the sanctuaries. This conversation wouldn't be complete if we didn't acknowledge Pahu, who is the rhino on the screen here. Um, Pahu is our first official rescue for the project. Um, back in November, um, she was living in a mining concession area in the Kalimantan region of of Indonesia and um, we so we uh, rescued her from there and now she has been relocated to a sanctuary in that same region and she is happy and healthy and you can tell she's happy because she's wallowing in the mud here and that means she's doing just great um, so really our goal is that we'll bring in more rhinos we'll start to really understand exactly where they are we'll bring more in and as Kira mentioned the end goal is not to have Pahu and a bunch of rhinos in, in a sanctuary forever. The goal is eventually to release them back into their natural ecosystem. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Cool. The other thing is we're not yeah. giving up on the protection. We're continuing to Good. protect the natural forests. And mm -hmm. we have partners, um, including the um, WWF and Rhino Foundation of Indonesia and Rudy Putra's organization, the fellow that you just talked about. They're out there day after day, 24 seven in the forests deactivating snares, ensuring that rhinos are safe. And they're not just protecting rhinos, they're protecting elephants, they're protecting tigers, they're protecting uh, scores of primates and birds and amphibians. And so these, these men and women are, are out 24 seven and we're ensuring that the, their habitat remains safe so that, so that when we do increase the population, we will have a place to release them to. Definitely. It, it really, truly is a proactive one-plan approach. I mean, we're working with, with collaborative partners all over using decades of science and expertise and really making sure that we're setting the Sumatran rhino up to succeed in the long term. I think that's what's different about this project. And I really think that we're, that we're setting up kind of a dream team for Sumatran rhinos and all working from the same playbook to ensure that this project is different and we do bring the Sumatran rhino back from the brink. What a wonderful note to end on, that conservation can be done in a, in a different way, um, in a united, coordinated way with government, with implementing partners, with the conservation community fully united um, on this. So thank you. I know that um, people in the audience are probably thinking, how can I help? Um, well, <laughs> what you can do is tell your friends about this small, singing, hairy rhino. And then visit our website here, SumatranRhinoRescue.org, um, to find out other ways that you can get involved. And I want to thank Rudy Putra remotely and our wonderful panel here and all of you for um, listening. Thanks. Wonderful. That was, that was incredible, wasn't it? Now, why don't we give another big round of applause to that rhino? He's hanging out in the back with us. So what, that's one of the most incredible things about the power of technology, right? It brings things to life in ways that we've never been able to imagine. And that's the most exciting thing about where conservation can go today. Now, 